Welcome everyone that's joining us. Welcome so we're going to start in about a minute. If folks can introduce themselves in the chat, if you want to state your name and your pronouns, and if you're affiliated with any organizations, feel free to do so before we get started. Thank you for joining us. Okay, thank you everyone for joining. Um, there will be more folks trickling in and that's okay. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, whatever time and whenever times uh, you are, it is 6 p.m. here in Pacific Coast time. Um, this is Freedom All San Diego's first political education event. Uh, my name is Leslie Quintanilla. I'm with the Center for Interdisciplinary Environmental Justice, which is also part of the Free Them All Coalition. And we're very excited to, to kind of introduce ourselves to you all this, that are joining us, that are, is the first time you might've heard of the Free Them All Coalition. Um, but we're a coalition of, a local, of local social justice organizations and activists that are committed to the closure of Otay Mesa Detention Center here in San Diego, but is also part of a larger abolitionist project. And I think what we're gonna get into that um, with, our, with our guests today. And a part of that work includes hosting events like this because education is a critical component to what the abolitionist project entails us and requires us to do. So first, we wanted to introduce a little bit of the protocols we have um, for how to have this conversation with a lot of us in, in the Zoom chat. So Jess, if you can tell us a little bit about our Zoom protocols. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Jess Waka. I'm part of the Freedom All San Diego Coalition. Um, most of you are probably familiar with how Zoom works by now, but I just want to point out a couple features for you. At the bottom of your screen, if you there's a little bubble that says chat, and if you click on that bubble, um, you can type messages um, either to any of us if there's technical issues, any of us from the Free Them All Coalition or to everyone. And as uh, Leslie said, that's a great place to introduce yourselves. Um, please uh, remember to mute your microphone when you're not speaking. There's a little button in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen that says mute. Um, and that way we'll be able to hear the speaker without um, a lot of background noise. Um, you can also raise your hand, although I'm <laughs> trying to remember how to do this. My students are great at doing this. Um, does anyone uh, remember how to raise, raise your hand? I don't see the button for it. Um, uh, so if you have a, a question, uh, you, you may want to just put it in the uh, chat bar and we'll make sure to call on you throughout. Um, I think that's it for now. I'm gonna turn it back to Leslie. Thank you, Jess. So the way that it's going to work tonight is that we have 30 minutes of a speaker's lineup where um, three folks are going to answer three questions for 30 minutes just to get us started into the conversation of what creating another world means, especially within the context of this current global pandemic and layers of climate justice intertwined with racial justice and all the different movements that are coming together right now that are literally structuring and visioning the next world. And so we're going to have 30 minutes of this conversation with our three guests and then we're going to jump into a 30 minute segment where all of you will be asked um, similar questions and you will be able to kind of work with us and work with each other around what does this next world look like and what does it entail for us to do following after the Zoom meeting. 
And so after that, um, we'll be able to ask each other more questions in the larger group and hopefully come out with, with some really good um, visionings and ideas for, for moving forward after we log off. And so we're going to start right now, um, st jumping straight into the program with introducing the three speakers that we have today. Um, number one, we have Imuat Luna, who's representing the, cent the Centro Cultural de la Raza and Otay Mesa Detention Resistance. And Jen Frost Moreno, who's a part of Armadillos, Busqueda y Rescate, and also We All We Got San Diego, that have been crucial hubs of, of activism, resistance, and mutual aid in San Diego. And I myself will jump in here and there, and I'm part of the Center for Interdisciplinary Environmental Justice, um, and I'll be chiming in to some of the conversation as well. And so we're going to start with number one, the first question that we have for, for our guests, but also for everyone to start thinking about as well, is how do you create a space of reflection? And before we get into that, um, the reflection piece, I would like for our guests to introduce themselves. So if Imoat, Imoat, if you could unmute yourself and just kind of give us a little bit more of a, of a background of who MDR is and what the Centro is doing um, right now. Um, thank you, Leslie. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Imoat Luna. I am part of the Centro Cultura de la Raza board member and also a collective member of Detention Resistance. We were previously old time as a Detention Resistance. Now we are Detention Resistance. Um, and I'm also part of other collectives, but I'm mostly gonna focus on the work and the structures that we're trying to uh, implement and how we organize within these two uh, or collectives and organization. Um, so that's my, my work that Detention Resistance has been here for the last three years. So we do a lot of work, uh, our work is abolition uh, inside the detention center, trying to um, abolish those colonial walls within the detention center, but also within our own society and be able to uh, visualize and bring light to the injustices and the inhumane uh, dehumanization that's happening within the detention center currently. And the work with the, with the Centro Cultura de Raza is more creative projects of self uh, auto of autonomy and uh, self-sustainability, uh, food security. Uh, so those are things that, that we are currently working at the Centro Cultura de Raza, but I will be speaking more on the organizational uh, aspect and structures to maintain long-term collective work here in San Diego. So thank you for joining in with us today. Thank you, Imwat. Hella appreciate the work that y'all have been doing for a long time for decades, but also critically in the last, you know, couple months um, during the pandemic, y'all have been holding it down. So thank you, Imoan. Um, next, I'm going to pass it on to Jen. If you could unmute yourself and introduce yourself and the work that y'all have been doing with Busqueda and also We All We Got. Hey, yes, uh, my name is Jen Frost Moreno, and um, I've had some delays um, traveling today, so. I'm nearly home. Thank you for your, your patience and for this access, accessible format. I truly appreciate it. Um, I'm here joining you um, to represent We All We Got Mutual Aid, which is a mutual aid organization here in San Diego that began at the start of the pandemic and was in response to our neighbors' uh, needs, responding to their needs. Um, mutual aid for us, um, is very liberating and I feel that it does represent the world that we want to be in because we are every day creating this future where we thrive um, and where we feel where we are liberated, truly liberated and we're helping each other get there. Um, the other organization that I'm representing is the Armadillos um, Search and Rescue, Ni Un Migrante Menos. And the work that we're doing there is um, to search in the Sonoran Desert, predominantly in the Sonoran Desert, for migrants who have been reported missing uh, while crossing into the United States. And this work is very um, heavy and it results in a lot of loss and a lot of trauma and a lot of generational trauma. And how we as a group move forward with that is supporting each other and supporting our community. So we do a lot of on the ground work here in San Diego as well, um, including with um, the Freedom All Coalition. So thank you very much for inviting me here to be a part of this space. And I'm looking forward to hearing from everyone today. 
Excellent. Awesome. That is a, a beautiful start um, to ground us in the fact that people have been doing so much work and putting in the time, putting in the energy, the, the care work um, that is unimaginable to some spaces and places and peoples. And, and this is something that we want to highlight, right? So that's what it's, what it's going to take and what it's going to look like for us today to imagine and build more spaces like like what was mentioned together. So thank you. Um, now we're going to jump in. Now this is it. This is the work. Let's go. Let's talk about it because it's important given the 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 clown clown spectacles that we've been watching um, in the media like yesterday night. So first question for us, um, for all of us to think about, and, and I'll hand it over to Imwat first, is how do you create a space for reflection? And this is whether personally or within organizations in times of permanent crisis. Um, where do you turn to for imagining another world and any concrete examples that you might have, whether it's poetry or music or theory or any types of spaces and places that have become you know, centers of refuge for that type of reflection is, is going to be important for us to think about. So Imwat, where is that space for you? Um, and where has it been for you? Okay. Um, I'm just going to jump into it. I actually wrote something in, re in reference to this, and I'm going to speak more of more of a collective structure aspect, and I'm just going to jump in. <laughs> but I guess more, more, first of all, identifying the crisis as a permanent does not make it a permanent crisis as permanence suggests it cannot be changed. But this is only one where it is no longer being sustained by the structures of capitalism and neoliberalism as previous crises have been. This is a fundamental political dilemma that needs to be called out, the need to, for dismantling of this entire system. What does this mean? It means that dismantling of all institutions of power to universities, social welfare, all financial institutions, and the healthcare systems uh, we maintain. We need to do more than to abolish ICE, abolishing the police and abolishing borders, because those are just parts of exactly what we need to do to dismantle the whole entire system. But it's not about saving what is good or not good. It means underlying that everything in the system is dependent on and resides and sustains itself through a social fabric of racial capitalism and social classes and will continue to surveil and police all aspects of our institutions until it is destroyed. But that until is key because it means it can, it can be changed and that is the radical hope that we have. Yet we need for it to take root in our ancestral indigenous knowledges and practices of those that where we reside. Respecting the people that are currently protecting their burial sites of their ancestors as our Kumeyaay siblings are doing right now. I'm here to share to all of you that are listening that you're already creating other worlds and those other forms of living that are humane, communal, and dignified. Many have been disillusioned and have realized that we have been left abandoned by the state. It does not care for us and we will never put forward the well-being of our communities, no matter how many of us play into the structure of power within the sanctioned and limited political arena. We do not need to be dependent on the state to provide care, food, or security. We must authorize ourselves to be autonomous and creating our own worlds and shape them into new transformative forms that change our paradigms and to ones that are truly respected and honor who we are who we are as people. We have learned from our indigenous communities that we have that we that have resisted colonialism, that they have their that they have their own cosmologies and perceptions of seeing and living in the world. Ways that have different times, calendars, and geographies that have sustained and survived for thousands of years. This system that we're currently living under has only been recent compared to the thousands of years our indigenous communities have been living. The state has and will continue to abandon us. We have become disposable to the capitalist system. We only serve them to be by being incarcerated, detained, and exploited. It is through the practices of mutual aid support, human care, and love for our communities that we will be able to overcome the continued repression in these times. We are living now, what we're living now requires us to stay vigilant to the moves of the state. There will be attempts to target anyone that poses a danger to the destruction and downfall of capitalism. We must prepare, we must be prepared. So what do I do personally? I immerse myself with community. We, ne we need collectivity. We need to create collectives that can be here for the long run, sustainable, that will be here through all the destruction and repression occurring in our geographies. 
While we have COMPAS and the front lines, there are others forming collectives of mutual aid that will be here to support and sustain the work in our communities. Collective work is the only truly effective way to organize and move towards creating other worlds. The collective work I speak about is incorporating the Zapatista principles and the ways we organize internally as collectives and organizations. These projects, these principles can be incorporated in all aspects of our organizing and whatever collectives, mutual aid projects, co-ops we put into practice for our own livelihoods as a community. These principles have formed and sustained Zapatista communi autonomous communities in the north of Chiapas and have only grown. These mass indigenous people from communities of Toxil, Texal, and others have put into practice a collective form of organizing that touches all forms of life in one's communities. They have created their own healthcare system, media communications, economy, education, and written their own palabra and their own books and teachings. And now have a generation of Zapatista youth that all they know is assisting in this form of, of autonomy that is independent from the state. What the Zapatistas did differently than any other radical leftist groups and is that they decided to stop dialoguing with the state and knew there will never be laws or promises kept of support of these communities that were fighting to preserve their lands commun and community. The Zapatistas are the only ones that have defied the government in such a way that they created another world that's possible. One that continues to grow and continue to expand these collective projects and deepening their collective analysis of how they perceive the world through a series of thousands of communicates that are made public through the Enlace Zapatista website. They have challenged capitalism and have chosen to fight it by creating the world their communities envision, living, a free, living as free people maintaining their autonomy. So I will leave it as there for this first question. Thank you. Imoa, fuego, fire, thank you so much. That was incredible, an incredible start. Um, I'll hand it over to you, Jen. Um, same question, how do you create a space of reflection in these times um, and in other times? And uh, where do you turn to for imagining a different world? Um, yes, first I'd like to thank you a lot for that beautiful, beautiful um, piece on resistance and survival. And I want to pick up where where you left off with, with thriving, um, with creating an autonomous community um, and with thriving as people who have been tested, you know, who have been marginalized in society. And I think that's also what we're doing uh, with our mutual aid group, with We All We Got San Diego. And like you said, you know, creating these systems that we don't have to be entrenched in that are ruled um, by others who are not of our community. I think that's so important. Um, one thing that we've been doing with We All We Got San Diego is we have um, a, a book club, quote unquote, where we're studying transformative justice. Um, we're studying of the work of black feminists like Adrienne Marie Brown, but specifically we're studying this book titled Beyond Survival by E. Jaris Dixon and Leah Lakshmi Piepsna Samarasina. And these black feminists and queer women of color are leading the way. They're leading the way and they're teaching us how to address struggle within our communities because we can't, we can't pretend to say that there isn't um, conflict also within our own communities. And so with transformative justice, we are trying to address conflict and address harm um, while also pushing the work forward. And for me, that's been really important to create the world we want to live in because there will be conflict and there will be harm. If we can hold space for both parties, then we believe that transformation can exist. Um, it's not without difficulty, of course, um, but I'm so grateful to my compas in this room who have been a part of that movement and have helped to teach me along the way how to do that. Um, another way that that we, you know, envision this this future and reflect is we reflect on each other's abilities. Um, I think that I want to be part of um, an organization that acknowledges that not everybody can produce the same amount of work as someone else, and I think that. Like you said, uh, Imawat, sorry, I'm so inspired by what you said. Um, but what you said with these structures of, of capitalism and production and um, enforcement and policing, the, these measures are done to people who are capitalist society deems not productive enough, not worthy enough. 
And so if we're replicating these structures in our own groups, in our own organizations, then we unfortunately we're not going to get very far. And so right now we're having some uh, deep, intense conversations about what each other's abilities are, whether that's mentally, physically, and where we can meet people where they're at, because that's what our that's what mutual aid is about. It's about meeting people where they're at, speaking to them about what they need to get free, and about you know harboring the resources that we have to make that happen. And I also want to mention that We All We Got is um, was organized by a group of organizers that is a bunch of different groups. It's Asian Solidarity Collective, it's Black Lives Matter, it's, it's March for Black Women, it's the Armadillos. And so we bring this kind of collective knowledge in to, to build up these structures to kind of filter out throughout our other organizations. And it's just been so inspiring to really focus on transformative justice on creating these models where we can move forward together in a healthy, sustainable way. Um, and then with the Armadillos, um, in regards to reflection and making space, I think there's a lot of emotional turmoil that comes with the work and we seek to heal together collectively. Again, we make sure that we are physically um, able, we take space to ask how each other is doing. And so for me, relationship building is so, so key to our movement and to pushing um, the movement forward. And um, yeah, I'm just so inspired by this question too, because I believe that rest is so important and rest is political. And uh, I encourage folks to, to do that, be political in your resting as well. Be political in your resting. That's a beautiful, beautiful statement, Jen. I know someone asked um, if they could share, if you could share the readings whenever you have the time or if somebody else wrote them down. Those are excellent readings. Um, you mentioned Leah Lakshmi, you mentioned Adrian um, Ray Brown. Anyone can just type them in the chat as well. Thank you for those resources. Um, in line with the models that you all have mentioned that can formulate right now collectively different ways of living, different ways of seeing, different ways of knowing, different ways of relating to each other. I think you all point to the to the very real, you know, ways that folks have been doing this work for a long time. And I think you're all, you all are pointing to the invitation of other folks to learn how to do that with with everyone that's in the room and beyond. So the next question that I have for you, and we'll start with Imoad again is how do you, how, how does that world look like that you envision? Um, whether you're living it now and folks don't necessarily know what it looks like, what it feels like, what it tastes like, what, what is that, that thing that you can let us know of that world? Um, and what has allowed you to, to build that world right now? Um, and then we'll, we'll go to Jen. So, so Imwan, um, how does that world you envision look like, feel like, taste like? I have no idea. All I know is that it's beautiful and precious. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I guess I want to elaborate more regarding the, uh, re regarding the second part that you asked and, and, and appreciate Jen and those are just examples and models that we should learn about and I just I kind of summarize a, a brief of how some of these uh, forms can be adapted through any collector or any organization and things that we have uh, implemented in detention resistance and we're trying to implement also at Centro Cultural. So I'm just gonna share a uh, brief about these, these forms of organizing that we have to do internally in our collectives to be able to create these worlds. So these forms of organizing or what I invite all of you guys listening to implement in your collectives or organizations and they're not easy to undertake or to implement. What the Zapatistas has shown us and has inspired millions around the world is that we need to radically change the way we do things that seem simple but hard to do. They're asking, I'm not asking, they're asking and I'm not asking to do or create what they have done. They have said it themselves a hundred times. You focus on building in your own trinchera, your own trenches. Create your own forms of living, but with these principles we have been able to create with commitment to our own survival and dignity and love for our people and our land. It's through our collective agreement that we take one step at a time to implement the world that we envision as a community. So that is key. So I will share how we have implemented some of these principles through our organizing and detention resistance in Centro Cultural de Raza. And I speak more about the collective work that requires maintenance to be present in the long-term work. 
because we want to be able to create uh, collectives that are here long term, long standing after through all these difficult times. There are seven Zapatista principles, as many have known, but I'm not going to talk specifically about those principles. I'm going to encourage all to look, uh, to take that homework for yourselves to learn more about those principles. But here I will focus on five fundamental changes that, need, that are needed in order to be able to practice these principles. And these five changes are things that we have uh, implemented in detention resistance. And it's one is organizing has to be horizontal across the board. Collective, being able to make collective acuerdos, agreements, being able to have rotational roles and responsibilities, being able to make decision, decisions through consensus, and lastly, being able to be in a companionment with all struggles of resistance. So I'm just gonna uh, very short, just break these down very briefly. But one way we move forward in organizing horizontally is that eliminating the hierarchical structures. What this means is that I'm not the only member from a collective and any one of them can sit where I'm sitting and be able to speak and share about the work that we do in detention resistance. I'm not more important, more well-spoken or more awoke than any one of my compas. We may have different understandings, but we share responsibilities and roles so that we are all challenged and able to learn the skills of one another to sustain the collective and long-term work, to sustain the community and the practices that is reflected through this principle to represent and not replace. I'm here representing detention resistance, but not representing Centro Cultura de Raza at the moment. It was the collective that agreed that I can represent the R for this talk. I can share the work we're doing with Centro, but not able to represent Centro as a community or collective. These distinctions are very important because these questions presented here refer to the individual perspective, which is needed in one's reflection. But when you're representing a collective, you represent an extension of the work that's being done rigorously at a collective and not just for your part. I have focused on the way our collectives has put in place some of these principles that are still requires dialogue to fully implement and continue analysis of what these principles mean in practice. This is why I, am a, I attempt here to today to provide uh, a perception of how it has been passed down through me through the work of a, a companion through Zapatismo and through uh, walking with the CNI communities. The collective acuerdos, what this means is that we only move forward as a collective until the entire collective has discussed any decision until there's a collective understanding and consensus of the matter. This process is what gives life and shape to the world we want to create, because it's only through the dialogue and collective analysis that we can move forward as a collective and supporting the decision that was agreed by everyone because we took the time to genuinely discuss it. The Zapatistas have shown us in a simple thing to do as organizers. You're not, you're no one alone, but you're valued when you're represented by your community that supports you 100%. And this is reflected by the principle that lead by the way. There are no leaders, there's no lead organizers. We all need to serve our communities and collectives. And the way that is done is through sustaining of one's community by having rotational roles within a collective to work from below and not to seek to rise. This principle reinforces the collective work done by everyone in many forms to support the political work, but you also support the horizontal roles that we partake in the collective we're all collective members in detention resistance. We're not working here to serve our own individual work with our own name, but the collective work to serve the, and uplift the struggles and voices of our compas inside the Ota Mesa Detention Center. The maintenance of our work requires all to be able to learn and to do what the other person does. We are focused on survival and the only way this can be done is by not depending on the work to be sustained by one individual or a core group of individuals. Roles and responsibilities need to be rotational. We are here to serve, not serve oneself. We recognize that we need to support the vulnerable in our communities and detention resistance has committed to accompany our compas throughout their stay, no matter how long it takes, and to visualize the abuses and exploitation, exploitation experience by those caught in the crossroads within the arbitrary borders. And, those uh, caught in the crossroads within the arbitrary borders and its white supremacist po policies detaining people indefinitely and continuing to cause so much human suffering. A crucial fundamental aspect needed to make collective sustainable is making decisions through consensus, allowing the voice of the collective to be heard and for dialogue to occur when there is a disagreement. For all, for all compas here, their reasoning and arrive at a, fun, uh, at a mutual proposal that all members can agree. This process is challenging because we should not be confined to a clock, to time, to a process of running a leadership meeting.
There's no time when, this, when decisions need to be fully discussed and agreed by everyone in the collective body in order to be able to move forward as a collective. This eliminates priv privileging the thought process of one or few individuals. In this form of collective decisions, we propose any ideas, suggestions to be considered, to be dialogued and discussed, so we can make decisions that encompasses the whole collective. It is where we put into practice this principle of to propose and not impose one's own ideas. And I leave it here, um, but I just wanted to reinforce that is these fundamental or internal uh, collective structures that allows us to be sustainable long-term. And I think that's the objective and the challenge that we have is detention resistance and also in Centro Cultura de Raza is to be able to really uh, try to implement and learn from these teachings that, that have been inspired by the Zapatistas, but how do we put them into practice? And I think that's the challenge that we're currently facing and we're currently analyzing and discussing, discussing internally in our collectives. Thank you. Thank you, Imwat, for bringing up all those different methods um, in a really, really intentional and deep way. Thank you. Um, I'm going to pass it over to you, Jen. Um, same question. How, how does this world look like um, that you're envisioning right now? Yes, um, this is a great question. And I want to echo a lot of what Imawat said in regards to the structure of organizing in a horizontal way. I think that's so, so important. And it's something that we also practice and we all, we got San Diego and the Armadillos uh, search and rescue. Um, I do also wanna lift up and echo what Imoat said about working as a collective and honoring each other's perspectives, um, where we've been, where we're going, um, what we've lived through, what we've seen. Um, and for us, you know, it's about seeing each other on this equal level, but also acknowledging um, the different paths that we've taken to get there. And so both of the organizations um, think about this collectivity in very similar ways as detention resistance. Um, and I think that um, it, is, it is the way forward because we cannot have ego when we are out in the desert searching for migrants. We cannot have um, one voice ruling over others when we're doing this very um, deeply emotional and important work, not to mention the physical safety of, of being out there. And so following these structures is really important for us. Um, I do want to also mention um, that for us, at least with the Armadillo search, well, I'll speak on both organizations, but I'll speak on the Armadillo search and rescue first. For us, what, what, the future looks like what the imagine does not include borders. Uh, it does not include border patrol in our communities. For example, in Ajo, Arizona, the border patrol uh, officers, the border patrol, they outnumber the residents in Ajo, Arizona. And so you have a community that was once you know, thriving with residents, small, small businesses. Um, there is the Oregon Pipe Cactus um, Monument there, which is um, a national park that only in the last 10 years has been built a huge border patrol station um, right on top of, right in the national park. It's the first um, border patrol station in a national park. And then the huge influx of border patrol agents um, coming into the community of Ajo, Arizona has deeply militarized um, that, that area. And so the world that we want to see, of course, does not include borders. Uh, it includes the free movement of people. It does not include enforcement. And this is why we have ab abolition at the center of our practice, because we do not believe that, that the freedom to move should result in death. And that's something that we're thinking about when we are out there. Why do we have to search for people who have died in the desert from dehydration, from getting lost, from being injured? Why? Why are people pushed to their death with this very human right to migrate? Um, and I get emotional speaking about it because uh, I have, uh, I have you know, family members who have crossed, have crossed back and forth more than once. And it's deeply rooted in our history from when Mexico 
was not even a nation where my indigenous ancestors crossed um, into what is now Mexico and then Mexico becoming a nation and my grandfather from Mexico crossing back into the United States. Um, this border has really convoluted our, our history and our indigenous past and has made it politicized. Um, so that's the world that we envision um, because right now we're not able to work with Border Patrol or uh, the sheriff in, in Ajo because they do not want to save human lives. They, they have said time and time again that they will not assist in searches, um, that, they will not, that they will not go out to look for migrants who have been reported missing. Um, and then with Wheel, we got um, that, that world with mutual aid. We're very focused on food justice. With Wheel, we got San Diego. And so the world that we envision, it looks like people having access to food, but not just food, having access to culturally significant food, having access to organic food, and also, you know, being taught, you know, being able to take care of oneself without having these structures of going to the grocery store, paying, um, overpaying for groceries, going to, to Whole Foods, paying $200 a week versus, you know, going to Food for Less, paying $50. We don't want to see those barriers. So with our food distribution, uh, what we do is we hand out three large bags of groceries to one family. Um, we do not require ID. We don't require that you have citizenship status. We don't require you show um, a proof of income. You just come and you pick up a bag and you're able to go. Um, we also deliver to folks who are not able to drive um, to the food distribution um, because of lack of access to a car. And so this is what really sets us apart because there still are these barriers to getting resources, to getting free food. And it really bothers me when folks say, you know, well, especially folks who are conservative or on the right will say, well, minorities have, have more access to resources because they're minorities. And this is simply not true. And it's, it's, if we were in the world that we are imagining, we would not have to, we would not have to push and stretch these resources to folks. And so I really want to continue building that world to say, look, you are just like me, you are me and you deserve food and you deserve, you deserve to be helped during this pandemic. Um, so, you know, we're still envisioning this world and you must speak it in order to see it. That's also um, how I feel. Um, and lastly, uh, I wanna round out by saying, as a queer woman of color, I'm, I am wanting to see a world where I'm not working in anger often. And I wanna bring anger to the table because it's, it's very valid right now where every day you are demeaned, you are questioned, you are invalidated, you are told you're crazy. And I wanna speak to my LGBTQ family and say, keep going, keep pushing in these organizing circles and, and believe that your inter intersecting identities are important and are so key to imagining this world. So thank you. Thank you, Jen, um, for, for showing us exactly what this other world um, entails and, and for your powerful um, story um, for sharing, us, sharing with us in this space. Um, so now I, I want us to all engage in the same questions and similar questions and, and hopefully we'll get a, a chance to meet each other or some of us will get a chance to meet each other in our breakout groups. So for the next 30 minutes, um, we have prepared uh, five groups with nine people each. And in each group, you will have a facilitator um, with Jess and Chris, Alexis, um, Fatima and myself. Um, leading this discussion where we're going to go deeper into the same questions with each other and we'll be able to debrief, discuss, um, and then contribute to the larger, the larger space um, after we're done with the 30 minutes. So um, right now you're getting an invitation to join a breakout room. Um, the facilitators will introduce themselves so you know who's, who's the one um, kind of helping along the space, but by no means creating it. So feel free to to take ownership of the fact that we're all in this together. So see you all soon, see you in 30 minutes. <laughs>